how did you get started in this? What drew you to blacksmithing? Uh, simply boredom. Uh, you know, I'm in the mountains of North Carolina and right on the Tennessee, North Carolina line. So there's, it's either you're growing up, it's either drugs or something creative <laughs> pretty much because there's no nightlife or anything like that. So you just have to find things to do. And I, um, when I was young, about 13 years old, I started hammering on a piece of steel, not knowing what I was doing. And then it just evolved from there. When was, when did you make like, what would you would call your first real blade? Probably not till I got out of high school. So I had, which was probably seven years ago or so I had been blacksmithing for around four years before I got out of high school. So I, I wasn't very proud of what I was doing until probably five or six years in. Does that now, is that normal for a lot of people? I mean, does it usually take that much time? No, no. A lot of people are really confused when they hear me talk about that because a lot of people see what I'm doing now and then they just assume that I started that way or it was like really quick for me. But there are so many people that are beginners who are coming up to me now, like wanting me to look at their work. They've been doing blade smithing or blacksmithing for a few months and their work is better than mine was four years in. And uh, I had a very slow uh, start to do it to it, and then it uh, picked up exponentially. Why? How come this? How come the start was so slow? I would say mainly because I was just so ignorant about everything. I was 13 years old, and I'm also very shy. Uh, so as a kid, I wasn't very outgoing towards adults who may have known more about blacksmithing than me. So I was pretty sheltered in what I knew about everything: tool knowledge, how to use normal tools or how to um, ask someone for advice. So and it wasn't until I got out of high school that I started really like getting more exposed to the blacksmithing community and, and taking off from there. I guess I'm not, I'm not entirely sure how old you are, but I guess this is kind of before like the YouTube era where you could essentially just look, Google it and figure out pretty no. much everything, right? No, I was, I'm 20, I just turned 25. So when I was in high school, I had the YouTube all the all that type of information and so i was just trial and error trying to figure things out but maybe i'm just uh not as good as a lot of other people and it, that's why it took me so long but um i think that a lot of people who are first starting out get down on themselves too quickly about their progress that they're making because if you were to look back at my progress it's pretty horrible compared to a lot of people's in terms of like the technical aspects, like you didn't get it, the forge wasn't hot enough, you didn't hit it with another enough strikes, or you didn't have like the artistic capabilities. I didn't know what good work was supposed to look like, which is what I've I've told a lot of people before is that you don't know what good work looks like if you don't know what good work looks like. If you have no example, then you don't know what you're striving for. I say it's a lot easier to tell in person what work should look like when you get to hold a knife that's made by a master than to see something on YouTube. 99% of blacksmiths or knife makers that you're going to meet are like top notch guys. They're going to share everything with you. They're going to invite you in. They're going to cook for you. They're going to um, camp out with you, hang out with you and, and share everything with you. And I wasn't really exposed to that early on. Do you think looking back on it, was that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, I don't necessarily think that that specifically was either a good or a bad thing, but I do think that you should suffer to a healthy amount of suffering is good for you in learning. Uh, I, when I'm teaching people, I often try to show them the wrong way to do something so that they then understand the right way to do something. If you're only shown the right way to do something, then you don't actually understand why that's the right thing. So it's important to go through hardships and suffer and make mistakes. And then you can say, Oh, I, I know why that's a mistake. I know not to do that. I know not to do this. I know how that mistake happens. And now I know how to prevent it. So that, so that we have a better understanding of the difference between something that you make and something that we can go to target and buy, right? <laughs> like what's, what's the difference between a knife or an ax that you make and something that I can go pick up for even like a high quality, something like I'm paying a hundred bucks for this kitchen knife. Like, what's the difference? Basically everything, every single part of it. A hundred knives, uh, sorry, a hundred dollars for a kitchen knife is not a lot of money. 
Um, maybe for Target it is, but uh, my kitchen knives aren't insanely expensive, but bladesmiths who specialize in high-end kitchen knives, I mean, you're talking about a three to 10 plus thousand dollar kitchen knife, not a hundred dollar or a $300 kitchen knife. And so, so when I say everything is different, I'm talking about the, the shape, the design, the geometry of the cross section, which is the cutting edge, the spine, the types of bevels, whether it's a flat grind, a convex grind, a hollow grind, a combination of a hollow grind or a flat grind, uh, the ergonomics of the handle, if it's an integral style handle, if it's a full tang, if it's hidden tang type handle, there's everything, the materials, the heat treating, which is the way that you process the material. And then of course, just the design, the design, the ergonomics of the knife is everything is different about it. And then when prices go up from there, you're mainly looking at brand and reputation because with high end blacksmithing, high end knife making, it is art. So you are paying for not just a utilitarian functional piece. You're paying for someone's brand, someone's art, someone's reputation, someone's experience. Is it like one of the things if, if I did a blind test and I pick up your knife and I pick up somebody else's knife, like the, the mass produced one, am I noticing the difference? Like, Oh my, that's, that's oh, yeah. the second I pick it up. Really? Yeah. You should be able to. Yeah. It, it's it just pretty different. The feel of it, the weight of it or all of the above, all of the above. Yeah. Without even looking, if you were in a blind test, I think that someone would be able to tell the difference between most production knives and most custom high end knives. Of course, there's going to be some knives, you know, on the spectrum that might be closer to others, but there really is a huge difference between a, an actual masterfully made high quality knife and a factory made knife. That's, I guess that's kind of surprising to me because I would be under the impression that like a computer can do just about everything better than a human. Like we haven't figured out a computer program that can design a knife that's better than one that, that you can make yet. Well, that's not necessarily it. So there's, yes, maybe we have the capability of doing it, but is that profitable? Is, uh, and then if you take, like we were just talking about the functionality aspect out of it, you have art, you have brand, you have reputation, and that's not something that the computer has. It's not personable. So um, people will spend X amount of money on my knives and axes, not just because the axe or the knife is good, but because people because I made it because it's one of my axes. Are we better at this? At like blacksmithing as a whole, are we better at this now than we were a thousand years ago? Or did we kind of have to relearn this skill? Better in what way? I don't, I don't even know enough about it to even clarify it, I guess. So like, I would, yeah. So I would say that, um, Shoot, I don't know. Uh, in terms of technological, uh, metallurgical processes, we're better now, 100%. Uh, so when you when you heat treat a piece of steel, that means that you you change the properties of that steel. So you can have a piece of what's called high carbon steel, and that steel can be in a annealed state, which is a soft state. I could bend it over my knee if I had enough leverage, uh, or that steel could be in a um, hardened and tempered state, which uh, would be total opposite of that. That same piece of steel could be hard enough to hold a knife edge. So, and, and then of course you have different alloys of steel. There's hundreds of different types of steel, which is like, it's like a recipe. It's like baking. You have iron carbon and manganese are your three main ingredients. And then you can add other elements to that. And they didn't have that back then. So I would say that modern day steel selection and our understanding of how to heat treat steel is far better than it was just a hundred years ago, much less 500 years ago. But in terms of the artistry, I honestly haven't seen any advancement there. Maybe, a, uh, maybe we've degraded. You can look at pieces from 300 years ago, especially in the Middle East area that are more ornate than I I've, I find it difficult for me to think of someone off the top of my head, a modern day maker that could make some of these pieces that were made 300 years ago without electricity. So I don't think that we have gotten any better in terms of 
uh, what I would consider craftsmanship. I don't, I don't know how much of like a historian of blacksmithing you are, but was the art ever kind of lost? Yeah. Right. Like we had to relearn how to do these things. Absolutely. Um, I'm not much of a historian on blacksmithing, but I do know that uh, there was kind of a lull between early 1900s and the 1980s where we got really into mass production, um, importing and that type of thing where the blacksmith was like a thing of the past. It was obsolete and there was a long period of time, probably close to 60 years where no one was really into blacksmithing as a hobby or anything. It was just seen as like this old thing that you don't, what's the point in it? And then there was uh, something that people call like the blacksmith renaissance in the 1980s. And there was a resurgence of guys and men and women that came forth and became, began blacksmithing again. And they did have to relearn a lot of things and dig up a lot of things. And then there was another lull again until about uh, seven, eight years ago. And it's just exploded. Like say you're, you're, you're going to make a knife or an ax. Um, how, how long of, of a process are we talking for you to make one? Depends on what type of um, ax. So if I'm making like a production ax, it takes a lot less time than if I'm doing a custom type of ax, a one-off type of ax. So when people come to order an ax from us, we have um, a catalog of products. There's like eight different models, for instance, that you can order. If someone comes to me and says, I want this ax to have this specific shape with this specific length handle, I, I won't do that type of thing. So you can either order what's on my website or you can't or, or go elsewhere uh, because I'm not interested in doing custom types of work. But whenever I get spare time away from production, that's when I can be more creative and just make whatever I want to make. And I call that like a one-off type piece. People would see that more of like as an art piece, a collector's piece, something that's more desirable. And an axe like that or a knife like that could take anywhere from not very long at all, which I would consider maybe eight hours to it, it could, you could be talking about a 60 to 80 hour project. Are you ready for some harder slash listener submitted questions? Sure. Yeah. Bring it on. What is the most important tool in your workshop? The forge, because you can't do anything without steel being hot. Um, there's lots of alternatives to an anvil or tongs or a hammer, but uh, you, there's not many alternatives to a forge which is what heats and the steel up. How many times a day or week do you think to yourself, man, this forge is hot? <laughs> um, pro probably at least, I don't know. It, it's always hot. The other day it was 105 degrees and, and that's, that's with like ambient temperature outside being 75. It's not hot where I live. If I, I couldn't imagine if I was on the, on the, in a desert or down in like Texas or Florida or something, that'd be so horrible. But even in my climate where it's not that hot, it's like over a hundred degrees with humidity also on top of that in the summer. And, and yeah, it's, it's hot as it's horrible. You burn yourself too. Like, I mean, is, is getting burned something that's going to happen pretty much all the time? Yeah. yeah or is it, is it. It anything ever like really serious? No, not that serious. I have all my digits and everything, but yeah, I've gotten burned really bad lots of times. Just from like a spark coming off, or uh, sparks aren't sparks aren't going to hurt you. It's what's called the most common type of burn is going to be from something called scale, which is uh, it's a flakes of steel that come off of the workpiece while it's hot. So when steel is red hot, it is rapidly oxidizing, just like rust. But that rust is, like I said, quickly, rapidly peeling off of the hot steel and it falls onto you. And that oxidation is called scale and that scale is very hot. And it, it is a, almost every time you forge, you're going to get a scale burn. Were you more excited or nervous when you got the call from Forged in Fire? Well, I've had multiple calls from them. The first couple, I wasn't interested at all in doing because I didn't think that I was good enough to make myself look good on TV. I, I knew that if I was going to go on the, on TV, on Forge and Fire, I, I needed to be confident in myself and be ready for it. I wasn't just going to jump into it. So I had a, a couple calls, uh, the first 
couple seasons that they aired and then the, the the call that I decided to go on to the show um I was I was more excited than I was nervous um I don't get super nervous with a lot of things and I prepared myself really well I'm pretty logical and methodical so like I I mean I trained I had all these scenarios in my head I I was I, like I was there to win it I was there I was there to uh not play around. So I wasn't super nervous about it. I knew what I could do. And uh, I was just excited to try and win it. And, and, and you ultimately won it. What did that kind of, what did that do for your business? Uh, nothing but good. So before, before I was on the show, my business was already doing really well. I think we had like a 10 month backlog before I went onto the show. And then I went onto the show and it's just been ridiculous ever since. What is the most durable thing you've ever cut through? The most durable thing? I think this is, I could get into this a little bit, but it's like a common misconception when uh, a, market, a marketing trick that knife companies or, or knife makers will use is to take a knife that seemingly shouldn't cut through something and then cut through that object, like cutting through a nail with a knife. And everyone's like, oh, wow, cut through a nail with a knife. And uh, you can change how durable a blade is based on the geometry or the thicknesses in the cross section of the edge of the knife. And so what that means is that I could take a chef's knife, which is supposed to be really good at cutting tomatoes, which is a difficult thing to cut well. And I could change the angle that I sharpen it at to be able to cut through a nail. But does that mean it's going to actually work well as a kitchen knife? No, it's going to suck. So it's like a marketing misconception scam when you see someone cutting through some like crazy object. So I don't have anything that I'm like, Oh, wow, I can't believe I cut through this crazy hard object or anything like that. It's more like, okay, if I make an ax that's designed to do this specific task and it does that specific task, well, that's what I'm proud of. Or if I take a chef's knife and it, I would say one thing that I was really proud of was taking a chef's knife and cutting through a tomato uh, without holding the tomato in my hand, cutting through it horizontally on a table without the tomato moving. That's a really difficult task because the knife has to be thin enough and have the right geometry to it. This kind of segues a little bit into that. How do you feel watching those infomercials on TV where they advertise knives? <laughs> oh, it's just, I don't even know how to react to that. <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> yeah, it's just a joke. Are you like, what, what irritates you about it? You're like, Oh, that's not the right handle. There's no way that blade can do that. Like, what are you muttering to the person next to you about that infomercial? It's not, it's just not even worth your breath. It's just, it's all just horrible. It's all wrong. It's all wrong. Yeah. It's just like for, uh, uneducated, uh, consumers that, like I said, it's like a gimmick. It, it looks good if you don't know. But then when you know, it's like, this is just so bad in so many ways. What blacksmithing item do you enjoy making the most? Um, I would say axes, axes and knives. I, I like forging axes and I like the finish work on knives more. So like knife making, high-end bladesmithing is not a lot of forging. It's more finish work. It's the sanding, the grinding, the woodworking, the polishing, the elegant shaping um, whereas axe making is primarily this, the primary skill lies in the forging, not as much the finishing. So if, if I'm talking about what I like to forge most it's probably going to be an ax because it's more interesting, more difficult, a knife, uh, not as much of a challenge to forge, but it is a lot more involved in the finish work. Most expensive knife you make, or most expensive item you make, least expensive item you make. Like at least expensive acts that I make, um, is I think around $220 and that would, that's like a 12 inch long little camping ax. Uh, the most expensive thing that I've sold, which was actually just recently, like uh, a couple weeks ago was a knife, uh, for $77,250. And that was a, um, hunting, small hunting type knife, but it had, uh, in custom engraving work on it. That was not actually done by me. It was done by a friend of mine named, um, uh, his Instagram name is the hand engraver. His name is Evan Watson. 
Um, and then I, I had a, a fancy handle on it and it was one of those things where this knife was, it was actually the last of this design that I was ever making. So that increased its value. My prices can range anywhere from a couple hundred dollars to around $8,000 right now. Last two from me. What is your favorite historical um, sword, knife, or axe? Hmm. Uh, I would have to put it in like a category of Persian, uh, Persian style knives from the late 1700s or mid 1800s. Those are to me the most ornate, beautiful shaped, detailed knives that, uh, that I've seen. Favorite fictional one. I don't know. I, I'm not much of a fantasy knife guy. Uh, and I get a lot of requests for fantasy types of swords and knives from like video games and stuff, but I've never really, never really been interested in that. So I don't think I have a favorite one. We do have a question that says, how do you feel about lightsabers? Lightsabers? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that would be great if, if it was real. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be super helpful. I, I think in a lot of ways. You could definitely make stuff a lot faster, couldn't you? Yeah. Yeah, I could cut yeah, through stuff. Easier. I could heat up stuff. It'd be great. But would that hurt your business, though? Because <laughs> I'd have a hard time buying a knife if I could buy a lightsaber. I'm going to be honest with you. Right. Um, I mean, people probably still going to want a knife or an axe for the novelty, even if they can cut a tree in half with a lightsaber and be faster. Yes, uh, you are a businessman. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I missed this one. Do you have time for one more? Yeah. What advice would you give to a young blacksmith? Somebody just starting out. Mm, I would say to um, not lose sight of the big picture. Be persistent. Do not give up so easily. And um, understand that suffering is just part of the process. And it's going to help you in the long run. Uh, that's all the questions I got, man. Is there anything else you think that we missed? Or what's kind of coming up next for you? Um, just... I'm just constantly busy. Got lots of stuff going on. Uh, I would say that if, if anyone wants to find out the types of things that we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, you can follow me on Instagram, which is Hoffman Blacksmithing. Or uh, on Facebook, we have a closed Facebook group, also Hoffman Blacksmithing. 